So welcome and uh, thank you, Thomas, for the introduction and sorry for the uh, delay. So my presentation is about the cultivation of uh, oleogenous yeasts on volatile fatty acids for the production of single cell oil. And uh, here is uh, my name, but the results I'm going to present are mainly from my PhD student, uh, Lukas Burgstaller, so a shout out for him. And uh, yeah, so uh, here uh, you have a short overview on, on, on what you uh, have to expect from my presentation. And I want to start right away with some definitions. So when we are talking about single cell oil, uh, we usually mean lipids that are produced by microorganisms. So the term is similar to si single cell protein, where we uh, think of proteins that are produced by microorganisms. And uh, what we actually mean are intracellular storage lipids, uh, which are fats, so three acyl glycerates, uh, glycerol esters of fatty acids. Uh, when we extract the storage lipids, we always co-extract uh, other lipids, which are mainly associated with membrane structures like uh, glycolipids, phospholipids, and uh, uh, sterol esters. So this is not what we really want to produce, but it's uh, some side effects. And, and we will see later on uh, that uh, the growth stage uh, will will have an effect on on the composition of our single cell oil and uh why are we doing this uh, so in many cases uh, the composition of these three acyl glycerates so the fatty acid profile is very similar to uh, that of plant oils and uh all their genius microorganisms are considered uh microorganisms that produce more uh, than 20 percent uh, of lipids in the dry cell weight and this value can go up uh, to 70 percent and uh, these are mainly uh, yeasts or, or molds and microalgae so uh, eukaryotic uh, microorganisms uh, they are very similar to us so when they have a uh, lipid uh, excess uh, carbon uh, that they uh, uh, cannot use otherwise because there's a depletion of another key nutrient like uh, nitrogen or phosphorate, they uh, store the excess carbon as fat. Unlike prokaryotes, like we heard from Bruno before, uh, they would produce uh, polyhydroxyalkanoates at the, the same conditions. So uh, what can we use uh, this single cell oil for? When you look at the literature that has been published, there's a lot on biodiesel production. Uh, I would not write this completely off, but uh, it's probably not uh, as popular as it used to be. Uh, you could use the triacyl glycerides and uh, transesterify them uh, to, to fatty, fatty acid methyl esters. And uh, you could also use the glycerol that is uh, usually generated uh, during the uh, biodiesel production as a carbon source, as we see later on. Then there is a large part uh, in food technology and nutrition. Uh, this only makes sense if we have uh, a suitable uh, composition of, of the single cell oil. Uh, you will hear later on from Vangelis on uh, polyunsaturated uh, fatty acids, like omega-3 fatty acids. So in general, this would also be uh, considered a uh, single cell oil, but uh, that's not what I'm talking about here. Uh, we could also think about the replacement of uh, specialized uh, fats. Uh, so there are some uh, publications on the replacement of cocoa butter. What would be really interesting from an economical point of view is if we could find a yeast uh, that uh, produces a single cell oil with similar properties to, to palm oil uh, as a 
replacement. Uh, so uh, with our experiments, we, we are not at that level, but uh, this would be a, a high value applications and there would an, be an actual demand for, for such a kind of product. Uh, what we are mainly fo focusing on is uh, uh, intermediate building blocks for renewable oleochemicals. And uh, there are some that are, uh, yeah, logical like soaps and detergents and also surfactants or, or uh, compounds for cosmetics. But uh, I'm showing this graph from a review from, from Probst and his co-workers. Uh, basically, we can uh, use chemistry to produce all the compounds uh, that we currently uh, produce uh, from hydrocarbons uh, based on, on fatty acids. This doesn't mean that it always makes sense or that it is always uh, uh, sustainable, but I just want to show uh, that there is a potential to, to go in, in many direction uh, from these kinds of uh, compounds. And uh, a short note on the metabolism. I'm not going too far into the biochemical details. Uh, when we are using uh, substrates like sugars or glycerol, but also the volatile fatty acids like we did in this project, uh, we are talking about de novo lipid accumulation. So uh, the key intermediate is acetyl coenzyme A. And uh, basically what happens is if a nutrient uh, like nitrogen or phosphorus is uh, not available, uh, the Carboxylic acid cycle is blocked, uh, uh, citrate is accumulating and passes into the cytosol, and uh, there it's converted uh, into acetyl coenzyme A. And uh, this is the uh, intermediate and, and the basis for the uh, fatty acids and the this is. Uh, there's also another way to accumulate lipids. Uh, starting with fats. This is mainly uh, done by lipolytic uh, organisms like uh, Yaruvia. Uh, it's not relevant for the data that I'm presenting here today. When we are looking at the substrates for single cell oil, we have a raw material, uh, which usually has to be converted into a form uh, that our yeasts or uh, other microorganisms can be used. Uh, and these uh, are conventionally sugar and starch plants, so uh, first generation uh, raw materials. And uh, we have a very well working uh, refining processes that are economically very efficient. And we end up with sugars. And it's similar for plant oils. Uh, where uh, we can uh, do a transesterification and get glycerol as a byproduct, uh, which can serve as a carbon source. Uh, the disadvantages of this first generation substrates is that they are uh, in competition for arable land uh, that we use for our food and, and for the animal feed. Uh, so there's a general tendency to avoid uh, the use of these kind of products, although they are very convenient uh, for uh, biotechnologists. Uh, alternative would be second generation substrates like lignocellulose. Uh, here, uh, we do not have the competition for arable land, but uh, usually these uh, substrates uh, have a high energy demand for the pretreatment because we have to split up uh, the lignocellulose, the lignin and uh, cellulose, uh, which uh, is uh, very strongly intermingled. And uh, sometimes we also uh, need uh, very harsh conditions for, for this kind of pretreatment. So the approach uh, within volatile is to use organic wastes and residues and as philip uh, previously presented uh, we are using a biological process uh, to convert uh, municipal organic wastes or sludge 
from wastewater treatment plants or uh, industrial byproducts uh, to uh, convert them into volatile fatty acids. Uh, in addition to the carbon source, uh, we also need other nutrients that the uh, cells need uh, for their growth. Uh, most importantly, a nitrogen source. This can be inorganic, but uh, as we will see later, uh, we also may need to add some uh, organic nitrogen sources. We need uh, phosphorus uh, and uh, vitamins, minerals and trace elements. and uh, some complex nutrients. And uh, when we cultivate the oleaginous yeast, uh, we uh, usually have two stages. The first one would be an unlimited growth uh, where we have the biomass propagation. And at some point, uh, one uh, nutrient like nitrogen, or in our case, it's uh, in most cases phosphorus, will be limited. And this is when the uh, lipid accumulation really gets on the way. Uh, so we just add excess carbon and the uh, uh, yeast starts to accumulate uh, uh, the single cell oil. Uh, where did we get our strains from? Uh, this was mainly done by uh, our colleagues from, uh, the, uh, from Umunio in Portugal. And uh, this has already been published. Uh, the principle is that you can stain uh, the single cell oil within the cells with fluorescent dyes like Nile red. And uh, what the people at Umenio found out is uh, that there is a nice correlation between the fluorescence that you get and uh, the lipids uh, that you can extract from the cells and measure by gravimetric analysis. And uh, they use this for a screening procedure where they screened uh, 379 yeast strains from their collection. Uh, they grew them on a medium uh, containing yeast extract, peptone and uh, volatile fatty acids like uh, acetate. And they came up with uh, four strains uh, that uh, were particularly suitable uh, for our purposes. And uh, we then chose two strains that we uh, looked at in more details. Uh, that's Apiotrichium brassicae and uh, Pichia cudria TV. And for these strains, we determined the temperature and pH optimum. Uh, we did some media optimization. Uh, we wanted to uh, uh, develop a pure mineral medium. Uh, uh, we were not yet successful to, to fully implement this. So you will see we mainly work on uh, a medium based on yeast extract and pepton. And uh, we also uh, had a look on the effects of volatile fatty acids on the fatty acid profile in single cell oil. And uh, the goal was to develop a fermentation protocol both for lab scale and for uh, pilot plant applications up to uh, 500 liters. So uh, for the lab scale protocol, we did it in uh, this uh, parallel uh, bioreactor system that you can see here. Uh, the optimal temperature was 30 degrees uh, and the optimal pH was uh, pH 6 for both strains. And uh, we used the medium composition uh, uh, based on 5 grams per liter yeast extract and 10 grams per liter peptone. Uh, there's still some room for optimization here. Uh, there are also different uh, types of peptone uh, necessary depending on the strain. And uh, it's an aerobic process, so we uh, have to uh, control uh, the dissolved oxygen. Uh, we have a set point of 20% uh, oxygen saturation uh, based on air, and uh, we are using a fixed air supply in, in this case. Uh, and uh, we are somewhere in between uh, 0.8 to 1.6 VVM in our process, and we can regulate the oxygen uh, uh, 
uh, amount in the solution with the stereo speed. Uh, Bruno already mentioned it for the uh, BHAs. It's uh, the same for uh, single cell oil yeasts. So uh, while many microbes or most of them are able to use uh, volatile fatty acids as a carbon source, uh, at the same time, these compounds can be quite toxic when they are in higher concentrations. So we are using uh, compounds like acetic acid or propionic acid also as preservants. So if, if the concentration gets too high, uh, we will have no growth and we, we have to deal with that during the fermentation process. And our way, way to deal with that is to make a fat batch process where we continually add uh, the volatile fatty acids so that they do not accumulate in the uh, medium. And uh, to do this, we use a pH stat uh, procedure. So uh, we set the pH to a certain value, in our case, uh, 6.0, uh, and add a small amount of uh, volatile fatty acids. So uh, it's only a couple grams per liter. And as soon as the microbes start using the volatile fatty acids, the pH will rise uh, due to the consumption of the acids. And uh, then we uh, add a new feed, which is acidic to, to control the pH. Uh, so the control is very simple and uh, we usually have only very low uh, concentrations of volatile fatty acids in our uh, fermentation broth. And based on these conditions, we uh, wrote the standard operation procedure as a deliverable. And uh, this was uh, the basis for experiments we did uh, on the effects of the volatile fatty acid feed. This was also uh, done in lab scale. Uh, and here we use uh, pure volatile fatty acids uh, in a feed concentration of 500 grams per liter, except for valeric acid, which we used undiluted. And uh, we wanted to find out uh, whether it has an effect on the biomass formation and also on the single cell oil formation, uh, depending on what kind of uh, volatile fatty acid we use and also if it has an effect on the single cell oil composition. And uh, in this graph, you can see uh, the gray bars are the dry cell weight uh, that we get per fermentation, and the red bars are the single cell oil. And uh, yes, there is an effect. Uh, so you can see that we get much uh, more uh, biomass when we are using acetic acid compared to uh, the other uh, volatile fatty acids, uh, so especially propionic acid and valeric acid, uh, the biomass formation is lower. Uh, and with that also goes uh, a lower single cell oil uh, formation. And we see that uh, to some extent also the percentage of single cell oil within the biomass is is lower with uh, other uh, uh, volatile fatty acids. And uh, here you see the uh, volatile fatty acid uh, profile uh, in absolute numbers. And you can see from the colors uh, that there are differences depending on the uh, volatile fatty acid uh, that we supplied in the feed. And uh, here I scaled it to 100% so that we can really uh, uh, compare the profiles. And uh, uh, we can see that uh, if we use odd numbered uh, VFAs like propionic acid and uh, valeric acid, uh, we get uh, significant uh, amounts of uh, C15 and uh, C17 and C17-1 uh, fatty acids in the single cell oil. Uh, and uh, these uh, fatty acids are not present in the even numbered uh, VFAs like acetic acid or butyric acid when, when we use them as a feed. Uh, 
So uh, there's a clear effect and uh, this means by the uh, fatty acid composition, uh, we can somehow uh, determine uh, what uh, the, the final single cell oil will look like. Uh, we then did a scale up. Uh, so we used our lab scale protocol and scaled it up to pilot scale. Uh, in 50 liter working volume and 600 liter working volume. Uh, the uh, 50 liter scale we did with both strains uh, and uh, we used uh, in this case an unsterile feed mixture uh, with uh, acetic acid and propionic acid with something that we would expect uh, from an ideal uh, solution that we could obtain uh, after purification from, from the uh, bio waste in uh, theory. So in practical application, uh, these concentrations are lower uh, and, and we, we have to adapt for that. Uh, but uh, for, for demonstration purposes, it's a great way to, to, to show what is possible. And uh, for the 600 liter working volume, uh, we uh, used a little bit the more concentrated feed uh, because we didn't have so much uh, 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 permeate available. So we had to use a synthetic uh, substrate and uh, it was easier to handle this way. Uh, and when we compare the results from the scale up, uh, you will see uh, the fermentation time differs a little bit. Uh, it's longer in the uh, uh, larger scale, which uh, is mainly due to the lower amount of inoculum that we used. Uh, and uh, this also lowers the productivity, uh, the overall productivity in grams per liter and hours uh, because uh, the fermentation time is longer. You will see that uh, the yield uh, and it, this is based on carbon because we are using uh, VFA mixtures is uh, generally around 30% and, and it's quite constant uh, uh, for all uh, uh, scales and also uh, for both strains and uh, that we also have a quite stable single cell oil concentration in the cell dry weight uh, which is uh, between uh, 55 and 60%, uh, which is uh, quite good. And also the dry cell weight uh, is quite uh, well comparable. I want uh, to say a few no notes on the effects of cultivation times. So uh, this is an example for the strain V134 but uh, we have similar results uh, for the other strain at 50 liter scale. And uh, this is the uh, overall composition based on 100%. And you can see uh, that uh, the composition in the earlier growth stages uh, differs from those in the later growth stages after 70 or uh, 90 hours of cultivation. Especially we find uh, more C18 and C18-1 components uh, at the later stage and, and, and less polyunsaturated uh, fatty acids. And it becomes more evident what happens if we look at the uh, actual amounts that we get uh, because uh, in the beginning we have low biomass concentrations and the cells are still growing. So uh, there is not so much uh, single cell oil uh, within the cells and uh, we have a larger proportion of membrane lipids when we extract the lipids and analyze them. Uh, and uh, during the end of the fermentation, the biomass concentrations are high and we have mainly storage lipids and uh, we have a higher amount of C18 and C18-1 uh, in the storage lipids. Uh, it also stays more constant at the later stages. So probably this is an explanation 
uh, why there are differences uh, during the cultivation time. Uh, there's not much time left. I just want to say a few words on downstream processing, which was done by our partner Technalia. Uh, it's a very important step. Uh, so we have to do the biomass recovery by centrifugation. In our case, we used lyophilization because we had the equipment available and it's easier at a smaller scale. At the larger scale, it's probably more uh, recommendable to use spray drying. And uh, uh, Technalia was able to establish a cell lysis and extraction process, which is very critical because we have to break up the yeast cells, which is not easy. And uh, the best protocol appeared to be a steam stream combined with uh, autolysis, uh, followed by an uh, extraction with n-hexane. So there's a lot of more to say on that, also because the downstream processing is always one of the most expensive uh, steps in uh, biotechnological production. Uh, but uh, what I can say is uh, it's possible to do it. Uh, we can refine it. Uh, you also have seen uh, Technalia was able to, to produce a soap from the, the oil that they extracted. And uh, we also have uh, quality parameters available. And uh, these are very comparable to what you can get from uh, uh, plant oils. And this brings me to my conclusions. So we were able to establish uh, the production of single cell oil from volatile fatty acids uh, for two yeast strains and at laboratory and pilot scale. And also the downstream processing was established. Uh, and uh, yields and single cell oil concentrations were comparable. Uh, the productivities depend a little bit on the scale. They also depend on the volatile fatty acid concentration in the feed. Uh, so there is some room for adaptation. Uh, and uh, we could show that uh, uh, the feed composition, especially the amount of propionic and valeric acid in the feed, uh, has an impact on the fatty acid composition in the single cell oil. Uh, and uh, there are also effects on the growth stage, which are probably mainly due to uh, a higher proportion of cell wall lipids in earlier stages. With that, I want to thank all my co-workers at Boku, uh, especially Lucas, who did most of the work together with uh, his master students, uh, Luca and Sebastian, but also our colleagues at Umenio, uh, Celia and Paula, and uh, the colleagues at Technalia, especially Laura, who uh, developed all the extraction processes, uh, but also Carlotta, who uh, sent us uh, the VFA substrates and our coordinator, Thomas. And, uh, I want to thank you for your attention and I will be happy to answer any questions if there are. Hi, Markus. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, uh, presentation. I'm just uh, trying to go through the, <clears throat> through the question section. Uh, are there any questions for Markus? We want to know something more about uh, single cell oil from, from G's. Do we have there any specific question? It looks like everyone is already in the lunch break. Uh, so there, there are no, there are no, no questions in the moment. Um, okay, but if there are any further questions, then um, of course you can ask them also later in the question section. Um, so I can forward it then to Marcos and then we can also answer them afterwards. Um, if there are no more questions, Marcos, thanks. Sorry, nobody wants uh, uh, has a question, but I suppose it's more to the fact that we have uh, 12 minutes, uh, we are 12 minutes delayed and everyone is already running for the lunch. Um, so then uh, 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 yeah, I would say we, we are going now for, for the lunch break. 
and then uh, we meet again at 2.10 for the second part of the uh, uh, presentations for today. Thanks to everyone already for joining and don't forget to come back. You can let it, uh, uh, you can be stay connected. We will, um, uh, yeah, uh, we will let uh, the, the conference system open. Okay.